and water from being lost, but then it sets up inside the leaf the conditions under which photorespiration is going to be much more common. And so uh, today we're going to start by looking at these two solutions. And basically, you know, both of them involve sort of recruiting a different enzyme to fix the carbon. So, you know, you think so far we just thought about with this, when we talk about something being fixed, you know, like fixing carbon, what we're talking about is taking this atmospheric carbon, CO2, you know, and attaching it to some molecule inside the plant, right? So that's fixation. And, you know, in C3 plants, that's done by Rubisco. But there are some plants that actually use a different enzyme for that first step, the fixing of carbon. But they still use Rubisco because if you do photosynthesis, you have to use you have to use Rubisco. So we're going to look at these two solutions that have evolved. And uh, the first one is called C4 photosynthesis. Remember, like what most plants out there are doing is called C3 photosynthesis. So that's kind of what what you learned about in Bio 161. So with C4 photosynthesis, uh, the solution is really sort of two parts. There's an anatomical component. And then there's also a biochemical component. All right. And so we're going to think about the anatomy first. So this should look familiar from last time. This is this little drawing of a, of a leaf epidermis or so a cross section of a leaf. And of course, it's got these stomata down at the bottom. There's the epidermal layer there. Now, the cells that do photosynthesis are still inside here, but they're arranged differently. And you know, we're going to draw this in a really simple way. Um, and you'll look at this in a little bit more detail in uh, in lab, so I'm going to draw these three concentric circles here, and I'm going to put a tiny little V in the middle. So the V there that stands for vascular uh, cells. So vascular, and you know the vascular tissue. That's that just you know uh, those are the cells which conduct you know water up into the leaf and which transport sugars out of the leaf. And we will spend a lot of time, a whole lecture, just devoted to those cells. But right now, those are the those are the transport cells in there, and then surrounding this, there are two rings of cells, and the outer cells. We've already heard the name of these. These are mesophyll cells, oh yeah, again, just like with the C3 leaf, there is also still air space in here right and gas exchange with the environment. Like that. So those mesophyll cells, they are really surrounded by that air um, inside the leaf. But then there's this inner layer of cells, um, whoops, and these are called the bundle sheath cells. So the inner layer is the bundle sheath cells. Oops. And they are essentially, I, I just want you to notice from this diagram, they are protected right from that air space right so they are because they're surrounded by the mesophyll cells so they're you know uh they're not in direct contact with that air space so this this anatomy here and you'll you know we'll show you a, a micrograph of this in a second this is called crans anatomy I thought this was because it was discovered by somebody named Kranz, you know, some German botanist or something like that. It turns out it was discovered by a German botanist, but the name actually comes from these uh, Kranz is, is German for wreath, and they have these, these round cakes, you know, um, that are called Kranz cakes. And so they, somebody thought it kind of looked like that. But here in the, in the micrograph, you can see what these cells actually look like. They're these little bundles of cells with mesophyll on the outside and these bundle sheet cells on the inside. Okay. So now we get to probably the most important diagram of this whole lecture. So um, you have this here in your, your notes. Now, just to, for right now, save this space in the middle. We're gonna write something in there at the end after we've filled out a lot of other details. And now this is, a, I think, a good example of the way we're gonna kind of use lecture. Like everything I'm gonna draw here and talk about, it's in the textbook as well. But I think this side by side drawing is something that textbook doesn't do, and something that I think will be helpful for you as you as you study this. Um, so save that middle space for now, and make sure you're oriented correctly on these. Now we're just going to focus on on this side of it first, and so let me get you oriented here. So um, uh, up the top here, this is the mesophyll cell, and the bottom cell here is the bundle sheath cell. And now the first thing to notice is that these cells have actually something that is pretty 
uh, common in plants, but not very common in animals, which is their cytoplasms are linked. They have these pretty big openings between them here um, that allow diffusion back and forth um, in the cytoplasm. And so these are called uh, plasmodesmata. I should fit that word in here. These plasmodesmata, they essentially link the cytoplasm of these two cells. So molecules are very free to diffuse back and forth between these two cells. Okay, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna mess up everybody's notes by doing this, but I'm gonna need this little space here that I do. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so out here, so the, the top cell is the mesophyll cell. So here's the air space in the leaf, right? And so there's CO2 out here, and there's also oxygen. Okay, so. Now what we're gonna draw is carbon fixation. We're gonna take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and attach it to a molecule inside the cell. Um, but it's not gonna be RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate, which you've seen uh, before. It's this other molecule called phosphoenol pyruvate, just abbreviated PEP. And this is a three carbon molecule. So C3, just a, it's a small sugar you know, with three carbons on it. And those get combined and we make a four carbon molecule. We don't need to worry about its name, but it's a four carbon molecule. And this is where the name C4 photosynthesis comes from. It's the production of this molecule, which is unique to this type of photosynthesis. And I don't have room to write the whole name here. You can look it up in the, the book, but the enzyme that catalyzes this is called PEP carboxylase. I'm just gonna write PEP ACE here, sort of as a placeholder, uh, PEP carboxylase. So this is carbon fixation, but not by Rubisco, right? And this enzyme, unlike Rubisco, is specific to carbon dioxide. So even though there's oxygen around, it ignores it, right? It is specific to carbon dioxide, so it's just going to pull the CO2 uh, in and, and attach it to this uh, PEP molecule. Okay, so then what happens? We still need to do photosynthesis, right? So the C4 molecule, it diffuses down through the plasmodesmata, um, and it enters a organelle here in the bundle sheet cells. And you might be thinking chloroplast, but it's actually a different organelle. This is the mitochondria. Uh, so the mitochondria is involved in this, in this biochemical pathway. So this is the mitochondria here. And the C4 molecule, you know, it sort of gets, it diffuses down into those lower cells, those bundle sheet cells, and goes into the mitochondria. And there, a different enzyme is going to split it. And so it's going to get split into back into a C3 molecule, but also it's going to release carbon dioxide. So we're basically just sort of, it, it, you know, almost reversing the reaction that you saw up at the top there, right? So we're splitting this uh, to, to yield carbon dioxide. And now that carbon dioxide goes into the chloroplast. So let's draw a little chloroplast down here, the thylakoid membranes inside there. And so this CO2 is going to go here into the chloroplast, and that's where the rubisco is. And the rubisco is going to then have you know essentially like a high concentration of CO2, you know, kind of concentrated around this part of the cell where uh, the where Rubisco is most active and where photos where the Calvin cycle is taking place. Okay, we have to draw one more thing here to complete this diagram, which is that the C3 is going to get recycled through a series of biochemical steps. So we regenerate that C3 molecule at the top. All right, so I'll give you some time to think about that and and. Finish up your drawing. And as you do, I'm going to repeat something I just said, right? Which is that we're, we still got to fix the carbon. We got to take that CO2 out of the atmosphere. But here it's being done by a different enzyme, PEP carboxylase, that is specific to CO2. So it doesn't matter how much oxygen's up there, it's going to pull in the CO2s. Then those CO2s are then released in the bundle sheet cell. And that's where the rubisco is most active. I mean, there's rubisco, you know, there's chloroplasts in the mesophyll cells as well, but most of the photosynthetic activity is focused on those bundle sheet cells. All right. So what does this, what does this mean? What's the implication for this, right? The implication is that these cells can spend a lot, these plants can spend a lot more time with their stomata closed, right? And closing the stomata minimizes water loss. And they can do that because even if the oxygen levels start to creep up inside that airspace, they have this other, this, this pathway is going to selectively pull out the CO2. So does that mean zero photorespiration? No, it's impossible to totally eliminate photorespiration. Some oxygen is going to get in there, but at least it minimizes it. And so these cells can, these plants can spend more time 
with their stomata closed. I'll come back to this diagram in just a second. And so if we, we kind of started this illustration somewhere else in your notes, right? So a C4 plant, to fix that same one gram of carbon uh, is going to go through a lot less water. So 250 mils of water lost per gram of carbon fixed versus 400 for a C3 plant. So it's much more efficient, it's able to you know, save water without incurring a lot of um, photorespiration. So 250 mils there instead of 400. All right, let me go back to here and just see if there's any questions or anything that needs any clarification on this diagram. We're okay? All right. So that's one solution. Some examples of C4 plants. A lot of the grasses are C4 plants. Uh, corn and this is sugar cane down at the bottom are some sort of familiar crops that are C4 plants. Um, and yeah, anyway, so those are just some examples, but, but it's especially common in, in grass species and grass crops. All right. So here's the second solution that evolved, and it's called CAM photosynthesis. And this is an abbreviation for crassulation acid metabolism, but we'll just call it CAM. It's a little bit uh, uh, it's fine to use the abbreviation. And the, the key thing here Oh, you know what? I sorry. I just thought of something I wanted to add to this diagram here. Uh, a term that's kind of useful for you, and I'll I'll fit this in here, is what we what we're seeing here is we would refer to as spatial separation. Spatial spatial so meaning like two things happening in different places. Spatial separation. Here, carbon fixation is happening in one cell, but most of photosynthesis is happening in this other cell, right? So we have carbon fixation happening in one place and, uh, and photosynthesis happening in a different place. So that's spatial separation. Now in the, the other solution here to this challenge of photosynthesis is CAM photosynthesis. And here what we have is temporal separation. of carbon fixing and rubisco activity. What is temporal? What does that refer to? Just go ahead and say it out loud. Right, time, right? So here, everything's gonna happen in the same cell, but the two things, carbon fixation and photosynthesis, are going to happen at different times. Okay, so here's our second diagram where we're going to write this out. All right, so um, so this is for a cam plant, and the top half up here that's grayed out, this is the stuff that's going to happen at night. And down at the bottom, this is the stuff that happens during the day. But notice that it's all happening in the same cell, right? So I'm trying to put these two diagrams side by side so that you can compare and contrast them easily. All right. Now we're going to draw a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah, and this is a, a mesophyll cell here, by the way. So, um, and so it's also like all mesophyll cells. It's going to be exposed to the airspace. There's going to be CO2 around, and there's going to be oxygen around. All right. Now here, what I'm going to draw next is going to be very familiar. We start with phosphoenyl pyruvate. We convert that into a C4 molecule. And we fix that carbon. And it's the same enzyme. It's PEP carboxylase. Oops. So, so far, totally the same. All right. Now, this one has a little bit of a challenge because, I mean, photosynthesis, it has to happen during the day, right? The light reaction creates the energy, like the, the forms of energy. We need ATP and we need NADPH for photosynthesis to work. And the lights have got to be on. To make those right so you can really only do photosynthesis during the day and so the plant has to store the c4 molecule until the lights come on and so that is stored in a different organelle inside the the plant um it's stored inside the vacuole the largest organelle in most plant cells is the vacuole and so the c4 molecule is gonna sorry the C4 molecule is going to get stored in here. 
So then a while later, when the, when the sun comes out, then kind of the same thing that we saw before is going to happen, where this is going to get split into CO2 and a C3 molecule. And then that CO2 is available for the Calvin cycle. So let's draw a chloroplast down here. And that goes in there for, for photosynthesis. So finish up your drawing here, pause and, and compare these side by side and try and notice what's similar between them, what's different between them. With the C4 plant, we had spatial separation, two different cells. Here it's all happening in the same cell, but we've got this temporal separation, right? There's some biochemical pathways, some enzymes that are more active at night, and then other pathways and enzymes that are more active during the day. Now there's one more thing we, we have to deal with on this diagram of regenerating that PEP, the phosphoenyl pyruvate. Don't, don't draw this in. I would love to just, just draw a little arrow up here saying, oh, we just use that C3 molecule to, to do that. But it's a little bit more complicated in these CAM plants and it's always bugs students. Um, you do obviously have to regenerate that PEP, but it actually comes from a different molecule. It comes from, uh, from starch. So I think about, you know, glucose is going to come out of the, let's see, I could draw glucose here. So, you know, glucose is going to come out of the chloroplast. Some of it gets converted into starch, and then some of that starch gets broken down to regenerate this PEP. A lot of students are like, what happens to that C3 molecule? Does it just build up? No, it, I mean, you know, it's a little carbohydrate, so it gets used for something else in the, in the plant, right? It could be broken down for energy, it could be combined into something else, it's not wasted, but this is a, the pathway for regenerating the PEP in these CAM plants. Um, I think probably one of the reasons for this is that because of the temporal separation, right, starch is a really good way to store carbon, and that's a lot of plants store carbon in the form of starch. So I think it's because, you know, you, you need to make a lot of PEP at night, so I think that it gets converted first into starch, and then at night when you need it, it gets converted into the PEP. All right. So go ahead and look at those two diagrams side by side. And is there any questions or anything that needs clarification? Yeah. Right. So the question is, in it, you know, why doesn't the C4 molecule need to go to the mitochondria? I can't really answer the, the why part of that. You know, I mean, those are two. These evolve separately, right? Kind of to do the same thing in some ways, but they're separate evolutionary pathways. And you know, the way evolution works is if it finds, you know, like if a if a find a solution that works, an enzyme that's already existing that maybe can can catalyze a reaction that ends up being helpful to the plant, then that's going to be selected for. So that's all I can really say is that these evolve separately. And you, and I'm trying to emphasize the similarities here, but you're right to look at those places where they're different. Yeah. So the implications of both of these is that the plant can like separate the CO2 with the oxygen. Yes. So the advantage of both of these is that you can you're I would say maybe a better way to say it is that you are not separating the CO2 from the oxygen, but you're just selectively concentrating the CO2 in these cells where that are doing photosynthesis. So when Rubisco, when you know when the lights are shining and when when photosynthesis is happening. I mean, I want to say this other way that sometimes students get through this and they, they kind of think like, okay, Rubisco, that's a thing in C3 plants. These plants are different. All plants have Rubisco, C3, C4, CAM. They all have Rubisco because they all do photosynthesis, right? So what these plants are able to do is just concentrate the CO2 around where the Rubisco activity is, is the highest. And that doesn't eliminate photorespiration, but it does minimize it. All right? Yeah, over there. Right, Rubisco, it's going to use whatever one is more abundant in its, in its neighborhood, right? The PEP carboxylase is totally ignored by oxygen. I think that's your question. Yeah, yeah right. Over here. Right. I really want to. So the question is, are they all doing the same? You know, I drew a chloroplast down here at the bottom, right? What happens in the chloroplast is exactly the same for C3, C4, and CAM, right? That part, 
We can't get rid of that part. Photosynth the photosynthesis is the same. What's different is just how the CO2 is delivered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is all happening in the same cell. It's just that there's some pathways that are active at night and other pathways that are active during the day. Yeah, right. Really good question. Now let's talk a little bit about some examples of cam plants. Oh yeah, so cam plants are, they can, so what they, you know, think about the advantage of this, they have their stomata open at night when things are, are cooler and generally moister and they're taking in CO2 at night. And then during the day when things get hotter, they shut down their stomata, but they've already preserved their CO2 for the evening. Uh, from the evening before so these are are use the least amount of water per gram of of tissue right so cam plants use just 50 mils of water for that same one gram of carbon uh fixed so these are the most water efficient plants so not surprisingly things like cacti and interestingly pineapples are also uh see are also cam plants and also succulents which are really popular now you know for de home decorating and i guess jewelry um, are also uh, examples of cam plants. In fact, it was in, um, you know, some of you might have back, you know, in your, in your home or something like that. You might have seen these, they're called jade plants. You know, they have these big sort of loby fleshy leaves. That's the, the, those are the plants in which this was uh, discovered. So if you're familiar with that plant species, those are the uh, uh, Crassalaceae is the, is the genus name for those. Okay, so one last thing, just to, just to put a bow on this here is, uh, we're going to say here in the middle of these two, I wanted to draw these side by side so we could see this in parallel, you know, so what we have in, in the, the, we kind of like imagine dividing this in half here. Generally, what we're going to find is higher concentrations of oxygen in the top half of this diagram, whereas in these cells down here at the bottom, we're going to have lower concentrations of oxygen. And lower levels of CO2 up here and higher levels of CO2 down here because we're concentrating the CO2 in those locations. And now here's the important part, right? So what we have is very low rubisco activity. Up there where, where CO2 levels tend to be, you know, and here I'm, I'm sort of saying relatively, right? So of those cells up at the top, they're exposed, when, you know, the exposed to the air space can have relatively high oxygen and lower CO2. But during in the cell or during the time of day when rubisco is more ac active, we've created these sort of high CO2 conditions. So here we have increased rubisco activity. And so those, now remember, most plants out there. Most of the plants you're going to meet when you walk out of this room are C3 plants, right? That is the most common form of photosynthesis. But there are these examples of these plants that have evolved to be more, you know, to, to solve this sort of dual problem of losing water versus incurring a lot of photorespiration. So they're able to do that. Yeah, question over here. I just wanted to correct it. Uh, C4 happens in the mesophyll and mitochondria. Is that the same thing? Right, yeah, I want to make sure everybody's, uh, yeah, that's, that's correct, right? So the, the cam, everything is happening in the same cell, right? If you've got temporal separation, yeah. Um, are there trade-offs to these solutions, or is it something where we would expect any plant who stumbled upon this to do this? Right, yeah, so that's a good the question is, are there trade-offs to this? And the answer is definitely yes. Sometimes students look at this and they're like, why aren't all plants C4 plants, right? This seems like it's way better. Um, but there is a cost to this, right? And I think if you are a plant in an environment where water is not limiting, you know, like, like both of these, you know, I don't have it filled out here, but they have to make extra enzymes, they have to make extra structures, they have to make extra molecules that a, C4, a C3 plant doesn't. So these are a little bit more expensive, but if you, but like you think about the cacti or something like that, right? They have allowed these plants to move into habitats where most other plants can't survive. So yes, is there a trade-off? Yes, there, there, there is. Yeah. So is the Kranz anatomy only for C4 plants? Let's ask, uh, is the Kranz anatomy only for C4 plants? Right? Just try, everybody trying to answer that. If everybody if think yes or, or no. Could we, should we apply the term Kranz anatomy to, uh, to cam plants? What do you think? Yes or no? Yeah, I've seen a lot of, what do you, what do you think? Okay, yeah, you're, you're right. 
go with your intuition, right? So the Kranz anatomy just refers to that double ring of cells, and that's exclusive to C4 plants, right? All right. I showed you these little cartoons. We're not going to really go through all these, but the bottom two cartoons represent, you know, the top one represents a C3 plant uh, where the worker is very uncomfortable and sweaty and not very efficient. The two bottom ones represent C4 camp. What I'll do, I'll put a, like a sort of a for fun little activity where you can look more carefully at these cartoons and just as another way to sort of test your knowledge as you as you get further on studying these. 